Hi everyone, thanks for joining me. I am Carla with Race to Walk and I am here with Dr. Holly Ordway. And you have a special treat today because you get to enjoy what I did while I was in the apologetics program at Houston Baptist University. And you're gonna to talk to Dr. Ordway about literature and books and especially about Tolkien, about her new books. So she is currently a fellow at the Word on Fire Institute. But before that, she was one of the founding professors at Houston Baptist University's cultural apologetics program. That's where I met her. She was one of, she was actually one of my first uh, professors in the class. And um, if you talk to anybody who has gone through the program and has had a class with her, I'm sure that they will all say that it was a life-changing experience because she is an amazing, amazing professor and teacher but she has written several books she doesn't just talk about writing she does it and she wrote her autobiography which is a testimony on how she came to faith that's not god's type she also has a very wonderful book on uh, imaginative apologetics called uh, apologetics in the christian imagination but this newest book that we're going to be talking about is about J.R.R. Tolkien and his influences. And um, it's called Tolkien's Modern Reading. And uh, I think it's, uh, you'll find, if you're interested in uh, the Lord of the Rings at all, I think you might find it very interesting because um, she blows apart a lot of misconceptions about him. So Dr. Audrey, thanks so much for joining us. And um, we, do you wanna tell us a little bit more about yourself and about your book? Well, well thank you for having me on, Carla. And, uh... And thank you for the kind words. I'm actually very pleased to still have a connection with HBU because um, although now I work full time, I'm a fellow of faith and culture for the Ward on Fire Institute, but I'm visiting professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist. And in fact, I just ran a summer course um, on Tolkien um, for HBU. So um, it's been a, it's a great program and I'm, I'm just delighted to still have that connection with it and to see what my students are doing. Things like you're, you're doing, Carla, which is very exciting. Yeah, so tell us about this book and why you wrote it, because um, I'll just be honest, I did not read Lord of the Rings until I was in the program. Um, I actually didn't really kind of realize how much of a, um, uh, I was in a churches that were a little bit more fundamentalist and they didn't like Tolkien. They thought he was, I don't know, they, but it wasn't something I read. So um, honestly, when I watched when I first read it, I had already watched the movies. And then when I read the book, I mean, to me, it seemed like um, just the message against industrialization was super obvious. So to coming at it from total ignorance about not knowing anything about the academic landscape, I was kind of surprised almost at some of the things that people were absolutely certain about, about his well, influence. You see that, you know, um, because you know, people come from Tolkien from all sorts of different places, and he's he's such a rich he's such a rich author. Um, and it's interesting that you notice right away that he is quite relevant to modern concerns. You know, he's very interested in, in you know the problems of industrialization, of totalitarianism, of issues of power. It's an extraordinarily relevant book, um, and I think when you come to it fresh, that's pretty clear. And one of the interesting things I found in my research is that I went back and I did some what's called reception history, looked at what had people thought of the Lord of the Rings when it first came out. And and there were a lot of you know, writers and critics who had, you know, responses like yours, oh, this is very relevant, this is modern, this fits in with modern literature. But pretty swiftly, people started trying to basically put Tolkien in this box of treating him as if he's only medieval, only nostalgic. This was happening even during his lifetime. Um, interviewers sort of it's assuming that because he had criticism of the modern day, which he does, that therefore he rejects everything modern and lives in some you know fantasy world of the past, which doesn't follow at all. But that that idea of him has become very entrenched in just sort of popular the popular mind, absolutely, and even to a fairly substantial extent in academia. I mean, there are scholars, especially in the last decade, who have figured out that this isn't the case. But by far, the prevailing assumption has been, oh, he was just interested in medieval literature. And in fact, when I started working on this book 10 years ago, I had that assumption too. 
because I, I had grown up reading Tolkien and I had actually in part been inspired by Tolkien to um, be a medievalist. That was what I first started mm -hmm. my graduate studies in. in. I, I did Old English and Middle English. And then I switched over to modern literature when I did my, my PhD. Um, but I had just assumed that because Tolkien loved medieval literature, that he was so immersed in the languages of medieval Europe, which he was, that somehow that was his only interest. I only his only interest, only influence. But as I you know, kept reading Tolkien and thinking about him, I started to just sort of see the inconsistency of that because The Lord of the Rings is, as you noted, such a relevant book for modernity. And it seemed to me a bit odd that a book could be so powerfully relevant for today and yet have the author be stuck in the past and purely nostalgic, which is what mm -hmm. I thought. So I thought, I, I, want, I want to look into that. And I was also curious as to what he had read of, of modern literature, because again, I took as face value his biographer Humphrey Carpenter's statement that he read very little modern fiction and took no serious notice of it. That's his authorized biographer making a fairly definitive statement. And pretty much everybody has fairly reasonably just taken that like, well, yeah, okay. If the biographer says so, he's the authorized biographer, must be true. I assumed it was. A lot of mm -hmm. good critics assumed it was. But I thought with this tension of, well, but it's so relevant, it's so engaging. I, I wonder if maybe he read a little bit. And uh -huh. I knew from his great essay on fairy stories where he, he names a number of modern authors. And I had done my, my doctoral work in the history of the modern fantasy novel. So I knew some of those authors, I knew they were significant. And I asked myself, I wonder what he thought of those authors. I wonder if I can follow up the threads. Um, and I knew there were some mentions in the letters. I knew there were mentions on fairy stories. And I thought to myself, well, let me just see what I can find out. Let me see what he had read of modern literature. Maybe this will help shed some light on this, this question of, of his engagement with modern culture. And honestly, when I started, I had no idea whatsoever that I would end up producing this book. Um, the book grew in the, in the aching because I kept finding more things. Uh -huh. more books read and more and more and more and they just piled up and I just kept finding more and I kept finding more evidence that he had taken serious notice of these things so about I'm gonna say five or six years into the project I basically sat back and looked at my research and said Humphrey Carpenter was mistaken <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what he was thinking but this is simply factually incorrect because Tolkien did read a lot of modern literature. I've got the evidence. He did take serious notice of it. I've got the evidence. I've got him saying so. Mm -hmm. What is what? How does this reshape our picture? And and really, in a way, Tolkien's modern reading came about of me just trying to figure out what was going on. I didn't set out to make a point. I didn't set out to challenge anything. I set out to answer a question, to explore what I thought was slightly unclear territory. And then I, I realized that the picture was, was mistaken and that I had the evidence at hand to do something to start correcting that picture. And I think that's, that's important to get a better picture of who Tolkien is and how he engages with, with the modern world. So would you say that because you did your dissertation on the modern, modern fantasy authors that you just knew like you saw some of those connections that maybe other people who weren't as familiar? I think it helped because I knew that Tolkien had, had in one sense done something very new with Lord of the Rings. Um, mm -hmm. But I also knew that he had come out of a tradition of earlier fantasy literature. He transformed the genre, but he didn't invent it. Um, and, and that tension that he's doing something radically new. And in fact, I think my examination of the genre helped me see just how new and innovative and sophisticated the Lord of the Rings is, because there's been so much literature after him that copies him, that just tries mm -hmm. to rehash, you know, indefinite like iterations, you know, different numbers of people in the fellowship and like, oh, we have halflings instead of hobbits and, you know, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, that it actually can, in hindsight, obscure the freshness and power of Tolkien's work. But since I had investigated what came before him, 
you know, William Morris, Lord Dunsany, Yair Edison, you know, the, the fairy tale writers. Um, I had a context and that in a way has been part of the theme of my work on Tolkien and continues to be, which is to look at his intellectual and cultural context. Because so often we look at him out, just out of context. We pull him out. We don't have any attention to context or chronology or what was happening in the world when he was writing. But the books that are overlooked now, you know, were bestsellers at the time. I mean, mm -hmm. I was, like, for instance, you, who now has read J.H. Shorthouse's John Ingleson's? In the entire 10 years of working on this book, I found exactly one person other than me um, who had read it before, you know, seeing Tolkien's one and reading it mm -hmm. <laughs> and reading it into that one person. Mm -hmm. It's utterly forgotten. Um, but it was a massive bestseller for years. It was it was a subject of discussions. Everybody read it. The prime minister read it. You know, Catholics and Protestants alike read it. It was a really big deal. And Tolkien even talks about it in his letters. But because it's forgotten today, people, their eyes just skim over it in the letters. Oh, a forgotten book I've never heard of. But we have to not let the passing of time kind of blind us. Well, let's put ourselves back in Tolkien's day. What were the books that were popular? What are the books that he was reading, that he was discussing? And it gives us, I think, a whole new angle and insight into the sort of dynamic way that he's engaging with, with his culture. You know, it's when I, when you read like so the Victorian writers, the things that he wrote, things from that time, there's like a, it's almost like a different atmosphere. You know, the mind goes on a different different track but then you look at some of the um dystopian writers you know you look at hg wells you look at uh jo jack london you know they were seeing they they were very talking about speaking to the culture things that they saw wrong and there's this heaviness to it it's almost like I, it, it's just a totally different feel to it and and Tolkien kind of, he addresses those heavy issues, but he still keeps that same sort of atmosphere of the Victorian, I think, a little bit. Well, he's, he's I think this helps to sort of see the, the innovative quality of what he's doing. He's a, mm -hmm. he's a great example of this sort of both and this creative productivity. Because one of the things that I discovered in researching for Tolkien's modern reading is that he read extraordinarily widely. Um, so he read the Victorian fantasists, the Edwardian fantasists. He read the people like William Morris who were doing pastiches of medieval literature. He read the fairy tales. He read the sorts of things that we might reasonably expect him to have read. He read children's literature. But he also read James Joyce, Gertrude Stein. He took them seriously. Um, he didn't necessarily approve everything they were doing, but he took them seriously. He read um, some very kind of harsh and direct um, modern poetry, like Roy Campbell's poetry about the, the war in Spain, the civil war in Spain, you know, very forthright, very um, powerful, um, very modern. And Tolkien mm -hmm. thought very highly of it, praised him as a you know, great poet. Um, he read a lot of science fiction. He enjoyed Isaac Asimov was one of his favorite authors. Um, he read, um, you know, realistic fiction. He, he loved the work of the American realist uh, uh, Sinclair Lewis. So he has mm -hmm. this very wide ranging um, taste and interest in all sorts of different things, you know? And I think that shows us that when he's working in the fantasy genre, he doesn't fall into writing fantasy just out of inertia. It's a very much a deliberate choice. And there was a, a thing I turned up in my research, uh, he wrote to his son, Christopher, um, that he had actually tried keeping a diary when he was younger. Uh, as a way of, you know, sort of you know, keeping up with things and found that it just didn't, it didn't help him. It wasn't what, wasn't what he wanted to do. So he says he turned to fantasy as a way mm -hmm. of, of engaging with it. And I think that comment to Christopher in that letter is an indication that he's very deliberately choosing his mode of engaging. And again, now fantasy is a tremendously popular, you know, genre. But it wasn't the, the dominant kind of genre that, that it is today in Tolkien's time. We mustn't back project our assumptions. There's, there's no reason why he had to work in fantasy. He mm -hmm. chose to, 
because it was the vehicle that he could use to explore the issues that he wanted to explore, which included very modern concerns, um, modern and also timeless. Like he said that the Lord of the Rings is all about death and the desire for deathlessness. Mm -hmm. um, if you're just joining us, we are discussing Dr. Ordway's uh, new book called Tolkien's Modern Reading. and it actually it addresses this idea that Tolkien only re read like medieval and earlier literature and she has written an entire book about how that is just not true but um this is we're going to talk a little bit about and want to um you explain like how this even came about and why what some of the the main misconceptions are about him um this is a quote made by C.S. Lewis, let me see if I can get this up. And he's, Lewis said, as for anyone influencing Tolkien, you might as well to adapt the White King, try to influence a Bandersnatch. And you mentioned in your book that that is part of what kind of led to this uh, misconception. Do you want to explain a little bit about that? Exactly, because that's, that's, it's a very catchy quote. Um, it's It's been, circulated widely. Lewis had a great gift for words and it's a very great description. Um, it's just not quite accurate. And here the interesting thing again to look at context because the context of, of Lewis making that remark is, is significant. He was actually talking to another critic who was, who was working a book about the Oxford Christians and Lewis was afraid that this particular critic was going to kind of put all of the inklings kind of in a box and like as if they were all cookie cutter versions of the same, you know, like writing Christian stuff in the same mold. And so he's taking pains in his conversation with this particular author to say, no, 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 we're not all the same. We're not all influencing each other. And he emphasizes that Tolkien in particular was not influenced. Um, so first we have the context. He's, he's deliberately trying to prevent someone from making an overstatement. So he's pushing a little bit further in the direction. Then he's also talking about personal influences. He's not talking about literary influences at all. He's talking about personal influences. Um, and then lastly, it's quite significant that at the end of that comment, the bit that's almost never quoted um, when people quote this bit is Lewis adds, um, he explains first of all, that when, when, you, criti when you criticize Tolkien, um, he either um, just goes in his merry way or he redoes the entire thing. And mm -hmm. that's a pretty significant response to influence to start over again. So that already gives a little bit of nuance, but also Lewis adds that his perception is that Tolkien wasn't influenced by others. But Lewis says, that's just my view. I might be too close to things to be able to see clearly. Lewis is completely, completely honest that he's just giving his perspective. And from his point of view, he doesn't see influence. So, Wait. yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Ordway spends quite a bit of time um, explaining, like, kind of the misconceptions, how it came about, uh, some of the the misdirection by Tolkien and also other people. So, I encourage you to get the book. And again, like, if you think you know who uh, Tolkien is, uh, you might have been had some of those misunderstandings. Um, and it almost seemed like. Uh, his biographer was like trying to sandbag him or something. I mean, it wasn't a very, is it, was it, was he as, um, was Carpenter as subversive as he, as he seems like he is in the, in the book? Well, that, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, and I, the book actually took a couple years longer to write because I was trying to figure out what is going on with Humphrey Carpenter. Um, I, he's a very complex figure psychologically, Carpenter is. And it turns out that for Carpenter, writing biography was a way of dealing with his own psychology. Uh, I found some very interesting interviews where Carpenter says straight out to the interviewer that um, every biography is really about the biographer. Carpenter says that. And he says that he could write a second biography with the same materials and tell a completely different story, mm -hmm. which is a slightly remarkable thing for a biographer to say, honestly. Um, and he, he ended up writing this biography of Tolkien, which is his first um, book that he published. Almost kind of by accident, he kind of got in his way 
into the Tolkien family through a smaller project, and he he wanted to do this. You know, he eventually made his name. It was a good project for him. Um, and I think, I think in the end, he found himself kind of not on the same wavelength as Tolkien or the other Inklings. I, I think, to, to be fair, I think he may have tried to. He wanted to be in the same wavelength. He tried to be at the beginning, but they were very, they were just thinking along different ways. Um, I don't think Carpenter ever particularly understood Tolkien. Um, and he ends up becoming, I think, almost frustrated with him. And in later life, he's, he's even very sarcastic about Tolkien um, and about the Inklings. So there's a there's a really a lot of psychological complication going on um, with Carpenter and his approach to biography, and it happened that Tolkien intersects with that, and the result is that the biography has certain issues. I don't think we can take Carpenter's word um, for things, you know, especially since you know, he reports facts. He occasionally gets them wrong, but every biographer, especially early ones, can get you know facts wrong. Um, but he presents a lot of interpretation as if it were fact. And that's, the, that's where a lot of later critics have, have run into trouble because Carpenter isn't always as clear as we might wish about where the line is between his summary of materials in Tolkien's life and his sort of judgment or interpretation of that from his own point of view. Um, and, later, and later biographers have, have picked up on his interpretations as if they were fact, and that has caused some, some major problems. For instance, um, as a basic one, Tolkien did not hate Narnia. <laughs> he did, but he didn't. So yeah, that's like, I think, I think I read that multiple times when I was in the apologetics program, actually. But I, some of the things though, it almost seems like deliberate because he, he, at least from your book, it looks like he takes parts of quotes out and just as the partial when if he had read the whole thing and what he says about them is completely opposite of what the whole the whole context of the well that, that that's that's overstating it let's let's be fair to carpenter um he's he when he puts the letters together um the, the letters the collected letters um it's only 354 letters most of them are just partial um and mm -hmm. it's very frustrating when he only gives a couple of paragraphs um and i do think that the cutting affects the way that we interpret it. Um, there's one letter in particular that I was actually able to compare versions because Carpenter gives only the middle portion and I found published elsewhere the whole letter. Um, and the part that Carpenter publishes, um, if you don't see the beginning and the end, Tolkien comes off as a little bit cranky towards a fan asking him about his life. You read the whole context, it actually, you see that he's not being cranky at all. He's actually kind of pleased to be asked and it's, it's a very gracious letter. Um, so there's some, the, the the using only of parts does shape our um, our understanding of Tolkien. But I want to be fair. I, I don't think the Carpenter is intentionally misleading. Um, I think he's getting a little wild his own interpretations sometimes about, for instance, Narnia. Um, but he's not he's not doing anything um, dishonest. I would say um, we, we must be fair. Okay. So one of the other things that I and this isn't necessarily directed. Um, directly from the book, but just as reading Tolkien generally is, it's always surprising to me that people will comment and write and about his books and they completely either don't see or they miss how much his faith plays a role in, in the books. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because like you see that in academics a lot. I mean, they use him for to illustrate things that he would have. I mean, there's just no way, you know, that I don't know how people miss it. Like, I, I don't think um, because there's actually two different problems with that, because on the one hand, there's quite a lot, as you note, of people who are fairly oblivious to the fact that Tolkien was a faithful Christian. Um, but there's also a lot of Christians writing books about Tolkien that are extraordinarily heavy handed and make the Lord of the Rings into kind of a, a gospel evangelizing tract. Um, mm -hmm. And so we actually, odd enough, we get both extremes and they react against each other, unfortunately, each one sort of driving the other to further extremes. Um, but in fact, neither of them is, is correct. Uh, and I think in terms of 
the people who are just unaware of his faith. Um, there's a couple couple reasons for that. One is um, lack of sufficient context, uh, and partly partly this is because Carpenter in his biography is relatively light and not very favorable in his presentation of Tolkien's faith. Um, he's he doesn't actually say anything disparaging, but the way he frames certain things casts a subtly negative light on, on some of Tolkien's faith. And I think we can understand this if we realize that Carpenter had a very conflicted religious life. He was the son of the Anglican Bishop of Oxford, um, but by age 21, he was an atheist. So Carpenter has issues with Tolkien's faith himself, and I don't think he's able to work out how to present that in the biography um, because he doesn't understand Tolkien's faith. So obviously he's not able to present what he can't himself understand or, or have any sympathy with. And then subsequent subsequent you know critics using the biography have you know followed that sort of trend. Um, but another part of it is that Tolkien himself, um, a very devout Christian, um, and is very clear that this is part of the undergirding of his of his writing. But he's also very clear that he writes he, his faith is implicit; it's submerged. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there's a famous quote about the Lord of the Rings that it's, Tolkien says, it's a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously in the writing, but consciously in the revision, okay? But then he goes on, and that is why I have cut out all the overt references to religion. Um, because in making it more deeply religious, he cut out all the overt references because he wants it to be, as he says elsewhere, that the religious message is in the story and in the symbolism. So mm -hmm. Tolkien operating, it's his, it's his choice, it's his, his technique to operate at an unconscious level, um, at a, a level that's implicit. So if the reader has eyes to see, he can see, um, and if not, not. Um, and I think that's, you know, that plays out in the fact that there are so many readers of Tolkien who have, you know, who are not Christians or have no religious faith and they are able to read and enjoy his work. And I think that is very much in line with what Tolkien wanted. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think that he wouldn't have expected the drastic decline in general religious literacy. I think he would have expected people to pick up on these things more than they do. Um, because I think there's a lot that people don't notice that he would have expected them to notice just out of cultural literacy that that has gone. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of the reason that, that Tolkien, you know, is um, that his faith isn't noticed as much is his is his style of presentation, um, which doesn't mean that it's not there or not important. Um, but it's we have to look at it the way that he presents it. And in fact, I will I will give your watchers a, a little bit of a, a preview. That is in fact my next book. Um, it's going to be called awesome. Tolkien. Christian faith, what he believed and why it matters. So I will be looking at this particular question in some detail. Awesome. You know, I actually talked about that. Oh, I think it was when I was doing a review on uh, the um, one of the Harry Potter books. And that was another one that I never read because, you know, I, like when they came out, I wasn't a young adult and I didn't have kids. So it wasn't even something. But also, you know, they're all in all these Christian circles. People are like flipping out about him. And when I read them, I'm like, I don't understand how people don't see the themes in it. And I, I think, I really think it's because people aren't actually reading the Bible. And so if you're not, and I'm not just saying like reading a verse, oh yeah, this is my favorite verse, or I'm doing like a little devotion here of a couple of, of you know, maybe a, a few verses. You know, like reading it, like actually reading it all the way through and like letting it, you know, being immersed in it. If you can't, if the only way you know what something Christian is, is by going to church and have somebody tell you that, then you don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. And so you can't recognize it because you don't actually know it. You just have somebody telling you what it is. And I think that's also why we get so many people, um, in mindsets that really have nothing to do with the heart of God because they're following a pastor or some other Christian celebrity who says, this is what 
God is about, and they're not reading it for himself. So they don't actually identify what that is, I think. Yeah, and also not understanding how literature works, frankly, um, which mm -hmm. also affects people's Bible reading. Because if you don't, for instance, know how metaphor and imagery work, you're not going to understand the Bible. Because yeah. the Bible is not a, a book of theology. I mean, it contains theology in certain parts, but a huge swaths of it are narrative in which sometimes people do terrible things. Um, you know, just because a Bible character does it doesn't mean that this is a thumbs up from God, uh, not quite. Um, mm -hmm. And we have the poetry, um, you know, the book of Psalms is, you know, so it's the prayer book of the Bible, it's poetry. If we don't know how to read poetry flat out, we're not going to understand scripture because that's how God chose to convey that part of the message through literature. And, you know, somebody today might, might be annoyed by that. Well, why couldn't God just give us, you know, a handbook? Well, he didn't. Um, in, his, in his wisdom, he didn't. He chose to do it this way. And I think we can trust that he had a, a reason for that. Um, and I think that general lack of literacy, um, you uh -huh. can read the page, but not, there's literacy, and there's, there's, there's technical literacy, but then there's just sort of deeper literacy. Yeah. I think that's why people, well-meaning Christians, and they're well-meaning, um, they want to be living a godly life. They don't want to read things that are harmful. And I agree with that. And there are certain things that you shouldn't read, shouldn't watch, pornography for one, don't do it. Um, and that's that's important. But how do we, you know, how do we discern what is what? If we don't know how to, like, understand how literature works, someone will look at, say, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It has a witch in it or, you know, the Lord of the Rings, it has magic in it, or Harry Potter, it has magic in it, it has the word witch, you know, wizard. And on, the, on that basis alone, they're going to say, oh, this must be wicked, um, without having an understanding of the way that stories work, the way that a character can actually be in the story so that we see that we don't want to be like that. I mean, the white witch in Blind Witch Nora was evil. We don't want to be like the white witch. Um, uh -huh. Um, and so, you know, or how, how does, you know, magic is a really profound image um, in a story for the working of grace. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of things that if you understand how to read literature, you're going to be able to discern whether something is presenting truth at a fundamental level or falsehood. Um, and I think that's, that's a larger issue, culturally speaking, you know, something the cultural politics program HBU is, is very keen on helping people to be more culturally literate so that we can do this work properly. Yes, and just before we move on to the next, we're going to talk about like uh, why there's so much confusion about Tolkien uh, when this is being streamed to the Facebook page for an unexpected journal. And that's basically what we do. It's all of what we write. So if you go and look at some of the pieces that we write there, it's an illustration of the type of thing that uh, we did in the apologetics program. You just read a lot, you write, and you synthesize it. So, just this is just a side note. This has nothing to do with it. But I, we would have sometimes we would have other people from other programs come in and take our apologetics classes, and they had such a hard time because it's like a lot of a lot of them are just regurgitating. You know, you have a question, you just repeat, re rephrase what it is that you've been told, right? But in, that's not the way it is in the apologetics program. You have you have to read it all and bring something of your own to it. You can't just, you know, kind of spew back what it is that somebody else wrote. And um, I, a lot of people, I've had multiple people tell me that that they can't, they couldn't handle that kind of writing. And so they said, I'm gonna take the class again. That was the hardest thing. But anyway, um, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is we're about deconstructing Tolkien and. One of the things you highlight in, I don't really know the right word to describe him, but part of the reason there's so much confusion about him is because he liked to misdirect people too. He almost seemed like a little ornery a little bit. Was he? 
<laughs> yes, yes. That actually was one of the delights of doing this research is, is getting a really a sense of Tolkien's personality. Because you know, I spent 10 years reading everything he's written, reading his interviews, reading his letters. Um, I spend a lot, you know, probably about three months of the year in Oxford, um, have done for the last 10 years, getting to know where he where he lived, where he worshiped, where he went shopping, you know, the book, you know, I, I shop in Blackwell's bookshop, which is the same place that he shopped, and just getting a sense of his personality. Um, and, you know, he, he, he was an interesting person. I think he must have been a lot of fun to be around. Um, and one of the things that I, did, I realized is that, first of all, he did have a cantankerous streak. And if you asked him a question like at the wrong moment of the wrong day, you know, he might be like, well, no, that's terrible. That's, a, that's absolutely nonsense. I would never do such a thing. And it, just because he was in a cantankerous mood, but his mood, but it was that there was an element of play acting. And some of his friends actually noticed that. That they would be having like these discussions at the at the bird and baby, you know, the inklings meeting, the inklings gatherings, um, and and one of his friends even recalled that he he could be like almost angry looking in his arguing a case, and then a few seconds later be laughing and jovial because he was a bit of a ham to be honest, and he mm -hmm. would just get really fired up about something, but it was it was playful, it was just his exuberance, um, and we see this in the way that he talks about what he read. And this, this element of hyperbole, totally characteristic of Tolkien, multiple people who knew him personally commented on his tendency toward overstatement, um, mm -hmm. which is problematic when people take a single quote out of, out of context, for instance, or without being aware of this. Because, for instance, he says that he does an interview where he, he starts talking about, oh, Dante, you know, can't stand him, petty little man. And that's somewhat shocking and remarkable. Um, and this was in a draft interview. And the neat thing about this is that Tolkien evidently realized afterwards, golly, I said this in an interview that's going to be in print. Oops. He wrote back, he saw the proofs of it. He wrote back to the interviewers and he said, actually, I wouldn't dream of saying those things about Dante. He was a supreme poet um, because Tolkien, Tolkien was a member of the Oxford Dante Society. He would actually mm -hmm. delivered a lengthy paper about Dante. <laughs> He, he liked Dante, he respected Dante, but he had gotten a bit rung up at the idea of being compared to Dante, because to him, that was too much. Like, that's too much of a compliment. He, he wouldn't dream of being compared to him. And Tolkien being who he was, he, he, he kind of blows up at Dante. Oh, Dante, mm -hmm. you know, no, no, no. And then, and then backpedals. Um, and that's a nice illustration. We actually have him in print saying, whoops, yeah, actually, actually, no. Um, and again, we have him, um, he's often quoted about his his hatred of allegory because he goes off on people who try to do allegorical readings of the Lord of the Rings. And he says, I have a cordial hatred of allegory and you know, have, have ever since you know, I could sniff it out. But he also writes allegory. He does allegory in several places. Um, Smith of Watton Major is an allegory, which we know because he wrote the allegorical key to it and sent it to his, his friend Kilby. Um, <laughs> So the thing is, is that Tolkien didn't like abuses of allegory. He didn't like it being forced on his work where there wasn't any. And he didn't like heavy handed allegory. But him being him, rather than starting with a nuanced point, he starts with the big attention getting statements and then he nuances it. So with Tolkien, we have to be careful to see that that bigger picture. But another factor, which is, I think, just delightful in this is that I discovered Tolkien is also extraordinarily English. And it's being among English people regularly for lengthy periods of time, over 10 years, that finally caught, helped me cotton on to this. The English are culturally very different than Americans. And one of the ways is that they typically use understatement and self-deprecation. And Tolkien does this. So when something is really important to him, he's actually more likely to understate it than overstate it. We see this in the beginning of On Fairy Stories. He is a world-class expert in this area. He's delivering an important academic lecture at, on this subject. Everybody knows that. And he starts out by saying, well, I don't really know much about this. Far be it for me, a mere amateur to speak on this. And I've actually taught this, this essay to undergraduates who, um, who said, why are we reading this essay by this guy who doesn't know what he's talking about? <laughs> uh, and, 
Well, the fact is, is that this is actually what the English call mirror talk. It's saying the reverse of what you mean, knowing that your audience will translate it. Because the English don't trumpet their accomplishments. Tolkien would never say, I am a world-class expert, listen to me. Instead, he says, oh, I am a mere amateur, take what I say with a grain of salt. Everybody in, his, everybody in his audience would have said, ah, yes, Professor Tolkien is reminding us that he is an expert and we should take him seriously, yet how modest he is as he does it. This mm -hmm. is so English. And I would never have grasped this had I not spent so much time in England and seen it happening um, and realized these, these English, they communicate differently <laughs> than we Americans mm -hmm. do. Um, and I think if you combine Tolkien's habitual understatement with about the things that he really cares about with his tendency towards playful overstatements when he's either riled up or whether he's just being playful mm -hmm. an extremely complex situation when it comes to understanding what he actually was saying now you can figure it out but you can't you can't just take a single passage or single quote and say well there you go that's talking on allegory or that's talking on such and such you have to look at the context and realize like, how is he saying this? Is he exaggerating? Is he understating? Um, it, it's, he's quite a complex figure. And I think that is something that, that has the, the Englishness of his, of his communication style has, I think been underappreciated um, by, by his, by his scholars and readers. So the other thing that I want to talk about, you mentioned that part of the reason that people have a hard time, or have misconceptions about him is that they conflate him with C.S. Lewis a lot. And they were very, very different people. Yeah, um, they, they kind of combine him and they make him as if, you know, what what's true of Lewis is true of Tolkien. Um, and that's not the case. Um, and this has been noticed by, by C.S. Lewis scholars as well as by Tolkien scholars. I mean, Michael Ward in Planet Narnia points this out from Lewis's direction that Lewis and Tolkien are doing different things in different ways. Um, and we have to recognize that they're not just the same. And with Tolkien, um, a lot of times people have projected onto Tolkien attitudes that actually were Lewis's. And for instance, they, Tolkien and Lewis had very different views on technology. Lewis could fairly be described as anti-technology. He refused ever to use a typewriter, just flat out refused, said it was horrible. Um, you know, used a dip pen all his life, got his brother to type his letters, um, and, and, you know, never learned to drive a car. And people have often assumed that that was the case for Tolkien, but Tolkien actually was a bit of a, I guess we call him a, a bit of a typewriter nerd. He had th like three different typewriters with, you know, one with a fancy keyboard for philological symbols. Um, he used a voice recorder to, you know, to record his own voice for, for different things. Um, he he knew how to drive a car he owned a car um and and in fact he goes in an interview to say that he enjoys driving in cars what he objects to is the way that road builders have just sort of indiscriminately blasted the roads through the beautiful countryside so it's not the driving he objects to it's the the road building that's been destructive and, and heedless and he also notes quite wisely that what is fine at you know 500 might be bad at 5,000. So limited uses of cars, possibly a good thing. He thinks it's a good thing. Massive use of cars, mm, now the numbers make it into a problem. So Tolkien has a much, much more nuanced view of technology than we have, I think, hitherto given him credit. And I think this is really important for our understanding of him because he's got, I mean, you noted this at the beginning, Lord of the Rings has a pretty potent critique of industrialization and of the abuses of technology. And I think that sometimes people have kind of backed away from feeling the power of that critique, which is extraordinarily relevant for our mechanized technocratic age. Because they say, oh, well, Tolkien was a Luddite. He hated all technology, but technology has its uses. It's, it's you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. But in fact, Tolkien would have agreed. Yes, technology has its uses. There are times when it's great. Um, it's the abuse of it that's the problem. So by sort of putting him in this anti-modern nostalgic box, it actually is a way of keeping him safe 
So we don't have to pay quite as much attention to his frankly prophetic critique of modern industrial capitalism, um, which, which we need to do. Um, and we can do that in part by looking at his nuanced views and seeing he, he was not a Luddite. That was yeah. one, that's one of the reasons it surprised me that he didn't like Dune, because their message is very similar, I think, as far as in terms of uh, very similar. Well, so, it's a case where we can't draw too much um, of a conclusion from the fact that he didn't like it. Um, he, he gets it um, fairly late. I mean, the, the June is in 1965. Um, so this is really late in his <clears throat> late in his life. He's in his 70s. You know, his tastes have, have slightly contracted over time, and he just didn't like it. And we don't we don't know why he didn't like it. Um, and there are any number of reasons why he might not have liked it, um, in, including the fact that you know he might not have liked the way that that Herbert was presenting a religious system. Um, yeah. yeah, and you know, and and that would be a legitimate critique. Um, or he just might not have liked the style. I mean, we we don't know enough of his reaction. Um, we only know that he didn't care for it. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to um, ask you is I, it surprised me his change of opinion about George MacDonald. That, that kind of surprised me. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I, mean, I think I would say first that it's, it's quite natural for people to have changes of taste over time. And Tolkien, I mean, again, we have to Tolkien had a very long life. Um, mm -hmm. And he read a lot during that time. And I mean, I know that when I look back and I, I read things that I enjoyed when I was in, you know, my teens, even now, it, you know, at 46, I don't necessarily have the same view that I had at 16 when Tolkien's, you know, looking at McDonald, you know, relatively late in his life. Um, so it probably might have just been a, a change of, of taste. Um, I don't know what his points of, um, of critique would have been. Um, I think we can at least say, because he, he he began to reread the Golden Key. He was asked to write an introduction to it. And it was rereading mm -hmm. the Golden Key that then prompted him um, to write Smith of Watt Major, as a as he even says that the McDonald became an irritant um, this, that led to him writing that. And I think at that point, you know, he had read and enjoyed, loved uh, McDonald earlier. By the time he's rereading the golden key he has himself developed a full-fledged sort of logic of how to write fantasy how to write fairy tales and i think i think he's seeing that mcdonald's not doing things the way that he thinks is maybe best um and that that might be part of it um uh it's hard to say what what else might have been the factor um i think too that he had begun late in his life to be a little more hesitant to acknowledge um, influences. He was perfectly willing to talk about them earlier in his life. By the time he had gotten older, he was less likely to talk about influence in that way, I think, because those influences happened so much earlier. And mm -hmm. I think he was slightly irritated by people saying, basically, oh, did you get the idea from McDonald? And I think in part that that might also have irritated him to reject McDonald out of that, as we saw, his cantankerousness. You know, oh, you think I'm copying McDonald? Well, McDonald, he's rubbish. <laughs> Again, so this is he, speculation. There was, a, he got a lot of, um, didn't he get a lot of people that kind of dismissed the book? Do you think that may have been part of it? Like, he was, uh, how do you want to say this? Like, George McDonald, what people remember him as is as a children's writer. So they may not have taken, maybe they didn't take McDonald seriously. And do you think that, that had anything to do with it? Like, has he got, no, I don't know. you don't think so? No, I mean, because yeah, Tolkien well, always took children's literature very seriously. Um, and I mm -hmm. think that he, he does, I think he does McDonald the credit of taking him, in fact, very seriously. I think that's why he reacts against him at the end. He's still taking McDonald seriously. He just no longer likes the way that McDonald is setting out to do what he's doing. Um, and possibly he might have had some theological objections at you know that point. Um, again, we don't know, but I do know we do know that he he always took McDonald seriously when he was appreciating him, and when mm -hmm. he was reacting against him. And that's characteristic of Tolkien that even when he is um, reacting against something, he's never dismissive. 
He's never dismissive. He's always even he's very vehement. He always takes seriously the thing that he dislikes or disagrees with, um, and that I think is a is a testament to Tolkien's sort of capacity of mind that he could he could find something worthwhile to engage with even in an author whose work he had gotten you know tired of or fed up with or, or didn't like. That's the other thing I know is like even things that you knew that he probably disagreed with very strongly ideologically that he still gave it the respect as what the work was, even if he didn't agree. Yeah, I mean, E.R. Edison is a great example of that um, because Edison, um, he wrote um, various fantasy novels, The Worm, Ouroboros and others. And Tolkien gave him a great compliment, said he was a, one of the greatest, you know, inventors of fantasy worlds, and he read everything that he wrote. Huge compliments. But he also mm -hmm. calls out Edison's philosophy and calls it evil. Um, and you know, he's he's very forthright. He fundamentally disagrees with the, what is actually a pantheistic philosophy that Edison is putting forth in his books. Yet he's able to to say. But I think he's a writer of great power and great inventiveness. Um, and I think that, again, I think we see also Tolkien's, um, the strength of his faith. He has a very secure faith. He's, he doesn't need to be defensive. He knows what he believes. He believes it to be true. He's confident in that. He can read Edison the pantheist and say, oh, yes, that is a terrible philosophy. But what a good storyteller he is. It doesn't threaten mm -hmm. him. Um, and I, that is another marker of sort of Tolkien's um, capaciousness of spirit is this this confidence in his faith that actually leads him to be able to read and engage with authors who have very very different views. Well, you have the bulk of your book is really like going through and looking at different works, and I have to tell you, she has a a chart in the back that lists everything that she found, every modern work of fiction that he read, how she verified it, whether it was, you know, he had a copy or whether he quoted it. And personally, I think it's like a great list of to, to read. I, I, and now I have a whole bunch of more, um, uh, yeah, it's amazing. It was really amazing and really helpful too. So if anyone is looking for things to add to their library, I would go back to that chart and start tracking down some of those copies. Um, she also takes out, and this is one of the things that really impressed me about the book, that not only like do you like know, know Tolkien's work, but you had, you literally like read, you read every single thing, right? And was comparing it. And so you oh, were able to, yeah, so she, she, there's like little things in each it, it's like this this um there's a quote in there about the i think i used it in the intro it's like you have all these little things that come in and you don't really sometimes you can pick an influence out and you can see where that came from but it's not like copying the whole work it's just these little things influence and that was uh, C.S. Lewis has a quote where he describes it, a source gives us things to write about and influence prompts us to write in a certain way. And I think if you read your book and then keep that quote in mind, I think that highlights the importance of, especially for writers, what we spend our time reading. Because when you, uh, we, I had a bunch of quotes, I don't know if we're going to have time to get through them all, but um, when you see how all these little things kind of got worked into Lord of the Rings, um, personally, I think it, for me, it's like, it makes me look at the time that I have to spend reading and think, okay, I need to make sure that I'm using this well. <laughs> like, what is, what is this influence that's going to be coming through? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because in the end, you know, the total amount of reading is an exploration of his modern reading, just like it says in the, on the tin. Um, but what it ended up becoming was really a, a portrayal of his creative imagination. Um, mm -hmm. How does his creative imagination work? And for me, that's so much more interesting. Because, you know, one of the things that I, I had, that I, I do actually address in chapter two of this book is a very legitimate criticism of um, source study. 
because you know some critics will say, um, well, what's the point of just digging up? He read this source and it connects to this thing. But what's the point of that? You know, we we, we find the source. Yeah, big whoop. And there, there's a legitimate aspect of that criticism because there is a type of source study that's really mechanistic, like they just mm -hmm. find sources and spots things. And what does that tell us? Not, not really all that much. Um, and it, and if it's done badly, it can lead us to a kind of mechanistic understanding of how creativity works. Well, that's not what I'm doing. Um, and Tolkien critiques that, um, and I, I take that into account. But what we're looking at is how. How does he create? Um, mm -hmm. And Tolkien himself says he does not create ex nihilo. He always has something that starts his imagination and germinate. Uh, and he's, he uses organic metaphors. And that's something I picked up on throughout this book is this idea that his, he writes this, you know, the tree of tales. And where does he get the nutrients to, to make this tree? From the leaf mold, from the mulch, from the compost, made up of thousands and thousands of things he's read that have been digested, that's his word. And some of these pieces we can trace, we can see how they contributed. Others, we know that they were part of that mulch and we can't directly see it, but I think we can we can make some educated judgments about how it might have, and I've done a lot of that. But I think one of the really important things about influence is to note that it's not just a one-to-one -one thing. Um, there are multiple influences. I mean, just take the hobbits. You know, there's the Snurgs from the Marvel sign of Snurgs. There's the, the rabbits from Beatrix Potter's Rabbits. There's there's the Babbit from Sinclair Lewis's Babbit. Um, there's all sorts of things. These are three we just know about that, you know, that, that come together, and plus many other things, to help Tolkien to invent these marvelous original creations of hobbits. And, and of course, there's all of the medieval influences coming in, also part of that leaf, leaf mold. And it doesn't reduce his creativity. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't um, diminish it. In fact, I would say it's the opposite. We see the absolute wealth and, and diversity of the things he read and the way that he used them and the way that he improves on his sources, um, the way that he transforms his sources and the way that multiple sources come together to to create new things gives us a picture of of a really vibrant, powerful creative imagination at work, kind of also in real time, which is just mm -hmm. tremendously exciting. I think that also points can help us be better readers uh, because I know. Uh, some people will read a book and they'll say, "Well, I read this before," or "This isn't original," or "This isn't." You know, they criticize it because they're looking at the, um, I don't know, like at the externalness of the story rather than looking at kind of the message that's flowing underneath. And so they look at these exterior things, and it's, you know, when you when you read, you know that there's really nothing new. It's like how how do you put it together? So I think that even as readers, it can be helpful to understand how creativity works. Because if there is this, um, if it's just like math, you know, just adding things together, then you're never going to enter into really the story and what the person is saying. And your imagination is not going to be able to go along with it if that's all you're looking at, I think. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right, Carla. And and that in that sense, also, Tolkien does teach us to read. He teaches us to read more widely, more generously, and more more thoughtfully, more imaginatively. Um, because you know the kinds of things that end up inspiring him are not what we would have expected. Um, and then, of course, you know, this is just his modern reading. There's also all of his medieval reading, all of his Renaissance um, reading. Um, so this. He, he really shows us the value of reading, reading well, reading widely and reading well. Well, we are just about at an hour and I want to thank you so much for this. We were going to go over some more quotes and illustrations, but you know, I guess you're just going to have to buy the book to, <laughs> to find all those because there's some really, really interesting ones. And uh, for those of you who complained about all the poetry and songs in it, 
yeah, she has a whole section addressing that. So anyway, but you can go to, uh, you can go on Amazon, but you can also go to uh, wordonfire.org forward slash Tolkien, and you can order it there directly from the publisher. And you can read more uh, about Dr. Holly Ordway and, you know, follow her and her work if you go to her website at hollyordway.com. But to everyone joining us, thanks so much. And um, I hope you in, have enjoyed this. And be sure to pick up her book and so you can learn more about what made Tolkien tick. So uh, just a second. Let me see here. So uh, uh, Dr. Ordway, do you have any final words? I don't know. I just want to say it was a pleasure to be on your show, Carla. Okay, well, thanks so much, and we will see you all next time.